just did our Thanksgiving pop quiz. Now we have a question on Hilly <laughs> Miller type inference. Guys, guys, are laughing. <laughs> <laughs> they're laughing because the, the quiz was so easy. Okay, so we have, so we're talking about Hindley Milner. We have a function foo A and B, and the result is just returning A calling B. So here the, uh, the tree would look something like this, right? And so the question is, what's the, um, what's the type of A, what's the type of B, and what does F or foo return? Can, can you make the, the right hand side of the array as well? The right hand side of the array? Yeah. Well, it's exactly the same as other problems, so. <laughs> I don't think that's really, I don't think that adds anything to the question. So the question is here, right, what do we know about B? B is just type B. Yeah, it can be anything, right? TB. It can be literally any type B. So then A, what's the type of A? Can A be anything? No. A is no, what does A have to be? Function that takes it has to be a function. A function that takes in what? Type B. So it takes in type TB and returns what? And then so what does foo return? Type TD? Or foo? What would this mean? That it could be different from TC? Yes, that it could be different from the return of A and that it could be different from B as well, right? This is basically saying that foo returns some type that's completely unconstrained and not connected to any of the other types. But if it's TC, it means it returns whatever the return of A is. That's the key thing. Yeah, so in the other case, it was the array element, but as long as you have the array, whatever was in the array be the same type as what returned. Yes. This is the key, is making sure that this TC, this TC are the same. And this B, TB, and TB are the same, and that this is a function in here. Okay. Still sorry. I think I feel better about it. Is that on me or on you? You don't have to answer. Okay. Any other questions? Cool. All right. You all are in for a treat because now we get to the heart of lambda calculus. So you, uh, this actually I think may be the best way to do it, I'll try to maybe do this from now on, is um, because this really, we're getting into what does execution mean in Lambda Calculus. And really to understand this, you have to know everything that we've done up until this point. You need to know how to do substitution, you need to know how to disambiguate Lambda expressions, which is something, and you need to know about free and bound variables, which are all stuff that hopefully you practice really hard on so that that way you did that very easily during midterm three. Right. Right? And so now we're building on top of that and we're going to talk about how does lambda calculus actually simulate execution. So, kind of, and now what we're really doing is trying to formalize our intuition that we built earlier that said, okay, this, this lambda expression means, what does application mean? What does an abstraction mean? Right, so now we're defining, okay, what does it mean to actually call a function in lambda calculus? So what we're going to do is we're going to think about execution as a series of terms, a sequence of terms, and it's going to be the result of, we can think of calling or invoking functions. So one step in this sequence would be we invoke uh, and call one function, and then the next one after that would be calling a second function, and then a third function, and so on. So each step in this sequence, we're gonna call a beta reduction. We're using these terms because that is what lambda calculus things use. So beta reduction, so every term in this step is one beta reduction. Cool. Okay. We can't apply this to everything, right? So if we have, I'm gonna do a new one. Right, if we have the lambda expression x, y, are there any functions to call here? No, oh, I have an application, but I just have two IDs. Is there any functions to call here? What about like lambda y dot y? Yeah, you can think of this as declaring a function, right? This is saying that this is a function, 
lambda y dot y, and it's defined as lambda y dot y, right? There's no, can we actually reduce this any by invoking or calling any function? No. No. But now if we have something like this, now can we reduce this? Yes, now we can actually invoke this function with the parameter x. So this is going to be called a beta redux. So this is, means that expressions in an application form where the left side is a lambda expression. So beta. So one question would be, is this in a beta redux form? No, because we're only, the function that we want to call is going to be on the left. This is when in application, left versus right is important. And this is why associativity is important, right? We have x, y, z. If x happened to be a lambda expression, this would mean first apply y to the expression first. And then that result applies z to that. Cool. But this is not, this is not in a beta redux form. Right, there's no reductions we can do. Good. Cool. So, of this form, so this is what we're looking for. Lambda x dot e, where e is obviously any lambda expression, and x can be anything. So here x really is just a placeholder, it doesn't matter. All that matters is the left-hand side has, is a, an abstraction, and the right-hand side can be anything. Cool? So I think I made the analogy before to kind of potential energy, right? So this means that when you see something in this form, that means that it's the potential that we can do a beta reduction and reduce this by calling this function. And so beta reduction, now that we've gone through the, I don't even know how many, how's it been three class, classes worth? Um, what's that, a lot of minutes, 150 minutes, and the midterm on building up all this machinery. But now, we can say kind of very simply what exactly we mean. Well, when we beta reduce lambda x dot e with n, what we're going to do is take e, take the body, and substitute all x's with n. And specifically, what x's are we replacing here? They're free now in e because we've stripped off the abstraction. Right? E is just looking at the body here because we know. So if we think about lambda x dot e as a lambda expression, all x's in there will be bound. Right? There will be no free x's in this whole expression. But if we take off the lambda x, right, just look at the body, then we can say all the x's that are now free were bound to this lambda x. And so we're going to replace all three x's with this new lambda expression n. And the trick here, it seems simple, the trick is when we have to do rewriting, right? When we have the case that inside expression, when we try to do the substitution, there is a lambda expression that is not what we're trying to replace, and that is a free variable in n. So that's the edge case, the corner case, that we always have to think about. So beta normal form is when we finally get to the end and we say, okay, we've done a series of beta reductions and we can no longer do any more beta reductions. So you can think of it as we reduce this function as far as we possibly can. So there are different types. So I talked about earlier that there are different types of ways. So you can think here, beta reduction is really just one, one step. Right? We want to take one application, and we're trying to reduce that one application. But there could be multiple, you know, there's no restrictions on this. We could have a lambda x dot x, y over here, and then here we could have a lambda z dot z, z, uh, more parentheses, x, something like this. Right? So here there's two choices of which thing I reduce first. So there are, and it turns out, and we're not going to go into this, but it turns out that the different strategies you have for which one you reduce first correspond to different types of pass by value, pass by name, pass by reference. Um, 
But we're not going to get into that. We're just going to say we're going to use what we they call full beta reduction. So we will reduce all reduxes regardless of where they appear. So this will mean that all the examples I give you will not matter which order you do the reduction in. So it doesn't matter if you do the first one, the second one, whatever. You will always be able to reduce it fully. I think that also means I won't give you any problems with loops. Because if it, yeah, right? Because you can't, otherwise it's just going to keep going forever and you'll never be able to fully beta reduce it. Cool. Questions on the terminology? The high level ideas of where we're going to go? Yeah? So like if we were just talking about arithmetic operations and digits, mm -hmm. the uh, beta normal form is just going to be this really ugly prefix arithmetic string? Almost. We'll see. Actually, we will define numbers, Boolean operations. We will define everything in terms of function. So a number will just be, as we'll see, a combinator. And depending on the structure of that combinator, it will represent different numbers. We'll get to that mm, probably not today, probably next Monday. But definitely, we're going to get to Boolean conditions now. So you'll see we'll build up Boolean logic just using functions, which is cool. Any other questions? Cool. OK, let's step through some examples. Super simple example, lambda x dot x applied to y. So the first question we have to ask ourselves is, can we perform a beta reduction here? Yes, we have an application. On the left side of that application is an abstraction. Boom, we can perform this. So then what do we do? How do we do this? Take the expression out. Take the expression out, which is x, and then do what? Substitute x with y. And we know how to do this. This is exactly one of the rules we have, which is just going to return y. Right? So this is why substitution forms the basis of this computation. This is why knowing substitution is so important. So then we can do cool stuff like this. Lambda x dot x applied to lambda x dot x. So how many choices do we have here and what we want to beta reduce? Two. Y one. So one is the outermost. We have an application. On the left we have a lambda expression. Which this is the body. And on the right is U and R. So why is this, this may have more than throwing people off, why is this one not a so this is an application. What's different? Oh, there's no switch. Yes, the left side is not an abstraction. The left side is just an ID. So there's no application, there's no beta reduction possible here. We're parsing, right? Disambiguation also come in. So you know how to read this. So what do we do? Take the body of the less abstraction. Take the body of the abstraction here. So remember, and this is also, so we go here all the way to the end here. So this is the body. So we're going to take x, lambda x dot x, and substituting x with u r. So then what happens here? So we have an application, so we just distribute it to both sides. And then after we distribute it to both sides, this x will get replaced with ur. And what will happen with this one? Yeah, it'll stay the same. Remember this lambda x, because it's the same meta variable, guards that. So we'll get ur lambda x dot x. So can this be further beta reduced? No. Yes. Because it's u space r, don't we just use u for x? Expression, but it's not the first. Where was that replacement where we were replacing? I don't know. It, it seemed like at one of the times in the past, if we had done this, it would have just been a U that went into the. Cool. So let's look here. What's the difference there? Yeah, let me copy this because drawing all these lambdas is hard. Okay. So the question is how is this? 
different from this? So what's the difference here? The R just disappeared. One expression? Yeah, so this we have three applications. Right? We have here, the U and the R. So we have to we use left associativity to group them. So we group these by here. And then this with this. So we have one beta reduction here. Right, well, we, where we will take this inside, replace x with u, and then that result will be applied to r. So we do this reduction, we'll get the same thing, we'll get u. This protects it. I think I need more parentheses here. There we go. So can I reduce this? How do you parse this? If I'm drawing a tree, what's at the top level? Expression. Well, of course it's the expression. <laughs> <laughs> Which of the four types of expression? Yeah. That was actually very good. Right. E. E. So which type? Abstraction or, I mean, you only have two choices really. It's either an abstraction or an application. So what's at the top level? An application. So then, What's this the rightmost expression? And what's the leftmost? So that would be u. Cool. And then what is this expression? Application. Application as well. And what's the left side? U. U. And the right side is lambda x dot x. Right? And this, of course, would then go down further, but to an abstraction. All right. So this is the. So the question is: Are there any applications here where the left side is an abstraction? No. Just an abstraction, right? That's the key. The the outermost needs to be an abstraction. Right? Because this is not an abstraction. This is actually an application first, where the left side is u and the right side is an abstraction. And so we look here, we say, okay, this is an application, but the left side is lambda. Or the left side, sorry, is an ID. It is not an abstraction. And we say here, the left side is not an abstraction. It's an application. So we cannot reduce this any further. Good question. Questions? Cool. We can go as complicated as we want. So now, how many choices do we have? Parse it. Okay, so it's going to be an expression at the top. So what's the first, what is this expression going to be composed of? Application. And what's the left side of this application? Abstraction. So it's going to be lambda x dot y. And the right side is going to be what? An application, it'll be this whole thing. So what's the left side of the application? And the right side? So how many how many beta reductions are possible here? Two. Two. We have two applications, and the left side here is an abstraction, and then here the left side is an abstraction. So here we actually do have a choice. So let's do, we'll do the innermost one. 
right? So we'll do this reduction. So we are going to take ZZ and we will replace inside of here. We will substitute the Z. Yeah, we will substitute Z with lambda W dot W. So we do this, the result is going to be lambda W dot W and lambda W dot W. So now how many beta reductions do we have? Does this mean we've hit an infinite loop? Yeah. We had two and now we have two? Well, no. it's different now. No. Yeah, we don't know yet, right? Yeah. We haven't. So think about if we ended up back with lambda x dot y, lambda z dot z, z, lambda y dot y, or something that was alpha equivalent to all these functions, then we'd get into a loop, right? Because we'd just be, keep outputting the same thing. But here, we did this, and yes, even though now we still have two choices in beta reductions, we're not necessarily in a loop yet. So let's do the inner one again, because that sounds like fun. So here, I'm going to replace inside the body here, this w, I'm going to replace it with lambda w dot w. So that's going to give me what? Lambda w dot w. So now how many choices do I have? One. Now what's going to happen when I do this? So you can think of this, this is a function that takes in anything and returns what? A constant value. So it literally doesn't matter what you give as input to this function, it's always going to return y. So we could have saved ourselves a lot of grief if we had done the outermost beta reduction first, right? <laughs> yes. If you do that, it's just going to return y, we have one step, we're done. But, so see, so this kind of shows even if, in this example, it doesn't matter which of the two choices you choose to do beta reductions, you'll eventually get to the same point. So, this function looks like a function that just returns a constant value, right? Returns a free variable y. What is this function? Does it duplicate it? What does it actually do? I mean, it does duplicate the parameter, but then what happens? It duplicates it with what? With an application? So it tries to apply its input to itself which is what happens here, right? Yes. So here we have lambda w dot w, what's that? Yeah, it's just an ID function. I mean, it's typically called an ID function, right? It just returns, it's a function that takes in x and returns x, that's it. Here's w, whatever, right? Super simple function. So if you apply that function to itself, what do you get? Itself. Itself, yeah. So that's what we can see happen here, right? So we can see this function z, applies whatever its parameter is to itself, and by doing that, we apply the identity function to itself, which gives us just back the identity function. But then when we finally do that and apply it to a function that always returns y, then it doesn't matter what we did, because we'll get y. Questions? Yes? Uh, the order of reduction doesn't affect the answer, right? In this example, no. In general, yes. In examples and homeworks and midterms, you will have in finals for this class. I guess I shouldn't say midterms, so maybe that scared you. Uh, finals <laughs> that you'll have for this class, uh, it will not matter which direction you go. There will always be only one answer. So you can think of it, this is a, a good example. I mean, we don't, uh, I'm not sure where I go from, or if I have this example, but let's think about this. I think this will probably illustrate this problem. So, this is a function that does what? Applies. applies its parameter to itself. And so, when you then apply this parameter to itself, what do you have? It's going to return itself applied to itself. And that will return itself applied to itself. So, let's take this by one step. Right? 
So we can take this. So let's see, I guess I can just copy this whole thing. I can get rid of this. And I can say here, inside here, we are replacing z's with this. Good. I think I need a closing bracket. Cool. And then when I do this, I will get this. If I do this again, what do I get? The same thing over and over again, right? So you can see if I keep beta reducing this one, I will keep, I've gotten now into an infinite loop because I did a beta reduction and I'm basically at the same functions. All these functions are alpha equivalent. The parse tree is exactly the same, right? But then what happens if I eventually make the choice, the other choice? You'll get y, right? So, yeah, it's, this is why the order can matter if you're not careful, right? Because you could end up in an infinite loop here, or you could just not, right? Yeah. Shouldn't you always reduce the outermost first because it's kind of a function inside a function, and when we pass argument, we first pass it to the outermost function? That's why I said it depends on how, what your parameter passing semantics are. So yeah, that's why by tuning that knob of which one you beta reduce, uh, that affects computation. So for the examples we're going to look at, it's not going to matter. So um, that's why we'll just do full beta reduction, because I think it's easier to, to actually do, and it's easier to understand. And if I promise you there will not be any loops, and it won't matter which way you go, then you have a way to self-check. If you ever get into a loop, you know you did something wrong. Cool. OK. Ah, man, yeah, look at us. We already just did this, right? So we replace this with this, this with this, this with this, so on and so forth. Right. OK, now we get into logic. You all know Boolean logic, right? So what do you need first? True, false, or false. Yeah, you need a true or a false. And then what do we want to build on top of that? So, 
based on our intuition, what should this return? A. a. So let's see why it returns A. So, what happens first? Reduction. Yes, reduction with A, right? We have to remember this is left associative. So we have first the parameter A is here. So what happens? So, we have, we take, do just our mechanical steps, right? This is why we studied all of this, so we can just do this mechanically. We look inside here, we go inside here, and we say, well, I guess I want to do this, this, get rid of you, and say inside here, replace X with A, right? So now what do we have to check at this step of our substitution? If y okay, if y is equal to x or not, if it was equal to x, we would not go inside of it. Then what? It's not. So what's the other thing? Is y free in this lambda expression? Is it? Should be an easy. Is y free in this lambda expression? No. There's only one variable called a. That a is free. So that means we can just go inside. So then we can replace this x with a. And so the result of this operation will be lambda y dot a. So what is this function, this lambda y dot a? What does it do? Yeah, it's one of these functions that takes in anything and just returns a constant. So when we apply this here, we just take the body, a, and we replace y with b, which is just going to be a. So this is how we had the true operator taking two parameters, right? And this is where you get the currying result from, right? Is even though it, each of these lambda expressions, each of these abstractions only takes in one parameter, when they're kind of chained like this, they're simulating a function that takes in two parameters. And so in this version, it just returns its first parameter. And we can see if we change this to y, in this next step, where here we replace this with uh, x with a, see there is no x. So this just becomes lambda y dot y, which happens to be the identity function of y to b, which is going to return what? Right? So true always returns its first argument. False always returns its second argument. So let's define an AND function. So what should our AND function do? How many parameters should our AND function take? Two. Two. So how do we figure out what, what we want? Yeah, so we need to build a truth table, right? Just like we normally do. I mean, we should know this in our heart of hearts and our mind of minds, right? But if we don't, we can always just do this, right? We have false, true, false, and false, 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 right? So this should be input one, parameter one, parameter two, output, right? Four lines. <laughs> It's like actually 40 of you or 50 of you in here, right? Input one, input two, output. True, true, true. Everything else false. Yes. Cool. Okay. There's a space. Or tabs more your style. Whatever. Doesn't matter. OK, so this is our function. So using these Boolean operations, right? now we have to construct a function that does this. But remember, the trues and falses that we want to return are functions. So we're going to need our AND function should be, mm, let me cheat. Yeah, there we go. OK. So we know it has to take in two parameters, lambda x dot lambda y. So, 
How do we construct this logic? So we have two functions, right? So we know we don't have to worry about types really at this point because we're basically only defining our AND function in terms of the parameters are true or false. So true is a function that takes in two parameters and returns the first one if it's and ret always returns the first one and false always returns the second one. So x y x. So what would this do? If it's true, it'll return the second parameter, and if it's false, it'll return the first one. Yeah. So here we have x. So x is now either true or false, right? And remember, when we write it like this, we're doing this first, right? So x is a function, and x is a function that takes in two parameters. And so if it's true, so if it's true, we're in here. And then so the return is going to be what of this x, y, x? Which of x of y x is it going to return? Y. And so if it's true, it's going to return y. And so if this is true and this is true, the result's going to be true. If x is true and y is false, then the return is y, which is false. So this has covered this. And so then if x is false, then what happens? Just return false. Return Just return false. false. Return itself. And it doesn't matter what y is. We don't even have to look at y. We know we always return x. I actually think this is a nice way to do it. The way we'll look at it here is we'll replace this with just false. So this becomes a little bit more clear about the logic. So if x is true, then the return of and If x is true, then the return of and is whatever y is. Right? So if y is true, then the result is true. If y is false, then the result is false. If x is false, then we take the second parameter, and here we're just hard coding that as false. So if x is false, return false. true, true. So right now we'll just do t and t by themselves. We won't expand them, but we'll treat them. We know they are uh, they're combinators, right? They don't refer to any free variables, so we don't have to worry about substituting them anywhere. And we know that they don't have a, any beta reductions inside them, so we can just leave them as representing this. Cool? So we have and, true, true. So if we write out the definition of and, we have lambda a dot lambda b dot ad, lambda x dot lambda y dot y. And here I'm using different a's and b's so that we don't get confused with the a's and b's from and and the x's and y's in this false function. Even though these x's and y's are all self-contained, right? So we know that they would be different just to make it easier on us. We will not do that. So let's walk through this. Let's verify that our intuition of how to build this actually jives with what this result should return. So we have this big expression, right? We have lambda a dot lambda b, a b, lambda x dot lambda y dot y, and then we have that applied with lambda x dot lambda y dot x, and that applied to lambda x dot lambda y dot x, right? Does it look scary? Kind of, but you know, we just peel it back layer by layer. So we know that this application happens first, this beta reduction, right? Because of the less left associativity of our disambiguation rules, we know that first we are going to replace inside here all of this body with all the a's in here with lambda x dot lambda y dot x. 
Everyone agree? So, inside here we're going to have lambda b dot a b, lambda x dot lambda y dot y, and inside here we're going to replace the a with lambda x dot lambda y dot x. Cool? We can do that? Everyone agree? Yeah. Wait, so we can do that? So we've replaced the a with lambda x dot lambda y dot x. So now we actually do have two choices. Right, we have two beta reductions. We have one in here, right, where we have this b applied to lambda x dot lambda y dot x. And then we have the outer lambda b with this lambda x dot lambda y dot x. But we'll do the outer one first. It actually doesn't matter, but since we've been doing the outside one, right, as we said, it won't matter. But we've been doing the outside one, so let's just apply this next one. Right, so inside here, we will replace all three Bs with lambda x dot lambda y dot x. Right, just the body of here, we're replacing it with this parameter here. So then we replace this free B here. So now we have something, if you just look at this, I completely agree, this looks crazy. Right? You literally have a bunch of Greek characters and X's and Y's. And maybe this is the point where you start to see the calculus inside lambda calculus. But that's really just a facade because we've talked about our understanding for what each of these functions does. Right? This is true. This is true. This is false. We know true is a function that takes in two parameters and returns which one? First parameter. So we know that it's going to return what? This first parameter. Right? It's being applied to two parameters. And it will return this parameter. Right? Here we have three applications. So the first application is going to happen here. Right? Well, let's walk through it just so that we're clear. So then I look inside this body here and I say, I'm going to replace any free x inside this body with lambda x dot lambda y dot x with my parameter here. And so do I have to worry about this y? I would ask the question, are there any free y's in what I'm replacing? No, it's a combinator, right? It has only bound variables. We don't have to worry about that at all. Cool. So that's going to replace this x with this lambda x dot lambda y dot x. So now we're at this intermediate state where we have lambda y dot lambda x dot lambda y dot x. Right? But that's fine. Because now we can do one more application and replace inside this body all free y's with lambda x dot lambda y dot y. Are there any free y's? No, so it goes away. And we're left with this. And what's this? True. So we just did a Boolean operation using functions, and only functions, and no functions with no names. Or, sorry, only functions with no names. Yes? So it's basically doing, you have true, and it's taking true and false, so it's just choose true? Yes, so it's using, so we're replacing the first parameter here, right? And we're saying that the first parameter decides. If the first parameter is false, well, here, let me go back here. It's a little hard to look at this. Right? If the first parameter A is false, then always return constant false. We don't care what B is, because that's the definition of AND. If it's true, then the return is either true or false, depending on what the second parameter is, B. And so in that case, that's what we return, is B. And we'll get rid of that false. And so this is why you build up the intuition behind these true and false functions. So you don't have to do this logic every time. But it's a nice way to check to make sure that A, you actually understand how this computation should be performed. Because you know what the result should be. Right? The result better be true. Questions on this? We, if we wanted to work it out ourselves, we could have just used two T's instead of lambda x dot lambda y dot x. Here? Yes. Done it more symbolically, mm -hmm. it would have worked out the same. Yep. 
You just have to, you always have to remember that those T's can be, like, if they're on the left side of an application, they represent an abstraction. So you can further beta reduce it if you had to. But yeah, when you're working this out, like, on a homework problem maybe, um, this, that's a good way to think about it at the high level, and then if you feel you need to go down to the low level, totally uh, do it. You know, it's not, it's, this is the cool thing, is each of these steps, right, is very mechanical, right? Doing these substitutions is just a mechanical operation that we wrote the rules down in four rules on a PowerPoint slide. But you get, you can create these Boolean operators from that. And so we do the same thing with true and false as an input. Kind of go over this quickly. So here we can actually do it abstractly. So here we'll do it symbolically. So here we have, we'll expand out the AND function because that's the one we're trying to test. And we'll say lambda A dot lambda B dot A B false. And so here apply this. This means inside this body, I need to replace all three A's with true. So I will do this, replace all three A's with true, so I have true B false. And then now I need to replace all lambda B's inside here with false. So all, sorry, all three B's inside the body with false. I replace this B with false. I say true is a function that takes in two parameters and returns which one? First one. And I could even expand that out further if I wanted to. I'm going to get false. Returning the second parameter because you know it's false, so you can just return yourself. It's a little bit more clear to try and drive to the intuition here. But you're hard coding it and saying if A is false, always return false. That is the definition of an AND. It does not matter what the second parameter is if the first parameter is false. Cool. And you can do this with false and true. And false and false. So you can just go through all of these cases and see, yep, the inputs and outputs match exactly what I think. Then this is actually done correctly. Cool. So then using this, how would you define not? So what's the output of so how many parameters does not take in? One. So if it's true, what does it return? False. And if it's false, what does it return? Okay, so then how would you write this? So now x is now a, x is now the true or false that we have, right? So x is a function that takes in two parameters. And if it's true, it will return the first parameter. If it's false, it will return the second parameter. What do you think? So we have x, right? We can go in a similar style here. We're going to essentially, you can think of this as evaluating x. Right? Yeah, so if x is true, the first parameter is going to be returned. So based on our truth table, what should that be? False. False. And if it's false, what should we return? True. There we go. We just wrote a not function. Yeah, and that's exactly what I have. And we can prove not t, we pass in t, substitute that t for a. True, false, true is going to return the first one, which is false. Not false is going to return false, 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 true, which will return the second one, which will return true. So using that, we've actually just developed all the Boolean operations we ever want. Right? We have and and not, and we can actually use those to define every single other operator. 
Cool. So we'll continue on Monday with if branches, and we'll get into more complicated, complicated forms of computation.